So hello and welcome back to the Dragonfly Daily with Mike. I am Mike Marsh, the product manager of Dragonfly at ORS, and this is installment number 22 of the Dragonfly Daily. Please follow me at Dragonfly Wizard on Twitter, where you can find posts about this content and other content, and you'll find that video content in our YouTube channel. Look there. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn or ResearchGate. We are on installment number 22, lesson number 22. Today is Wednesday of this week. This is a reminder there will be no Dragonfly Daily on tomorrow or Friday. We will be giving 90 minute or on the order of uh, 75 to 90 minute lectures as part of the CCEM workshop, reach out and register for that so you can attend those live. If you are watching this Lesson 22 Slice Analysis on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Give us a like so we know that you are engaged and we have a viewing audience for this content. As I say, today is a lesson on slice analysis. Yesterday's lesson was on objects analysis, which does 3D shape analysis and intensity analysis on grains or fibers or pores or something you have segmented and you wish to analyze in 3D. Slice analysis is the topic for today. It allows you to connect or it allows you to compute rather measurements made on a slice by slice basis over a data set, which can be useful in some cases. Now, the slice analysis, we will be showing you that for slice analysis, you can pick any axis. So it could be one of your three orthogonal axes axes parallel to your data set, or it could be any arbitrary oblique axis. I will give you this warning and I'll show you during the content that if you happen to tip your view away from the analysis, away from the axis where you perform your analysis, you won't preserve those results. So your results are vulnerable to you tipping away. You'll see what I mean soon. You can make measurements on images or ROIs. You can also use a mask to restrict which pixel values are evaluated in a particular measurement. So you can either perform over every pixel in a slice or only the pixels in a slice marked by an ROI mask. You will see the ability of to enable checkboxes and the ability to make selections. You'll see that checking the box allows you to specify which measurements you wish, to, you wish to compute, and then selecting measurements will interactively change which ones are plotted at any given time. You'll also see that you can interactively slice in the 2D view or on the slice analysis plot to do this correlative analysis, or I shouldn't maybe use the word correlative, but you are able to correlate the slice you are looking at in the 2D view with its position on the plot. Now, having said all of that, I know there was some interest in dual energy, so I'm uh, putting this call out. If you are interested in dual energy, if you have core samples, if you have a medical CT scanner, and maybe you have access to reference materials such as calcite quartz, we'll actually be diving a little deeper into this if we initiate a collaboration. We can uh, build a workflow pretty quickly in Dragonfly for being able to compute the effective atomic number and the bulk density, so your row B and your ZF. So if you have interest in that, send an email to collaborate at theobjects.com so we can discuss that further. Now, uh, we're not at questions and answers. It, this is my prompt to switch over to Dragonfly. Now, here we are, here we are in Dragonfly. I'm going to import some data. Uh, what I'm actually going to import is, well, let's see. I want to import that data set that we used yesterday, which had some grains from the sand pack. So here it is, dry sand pack. I'll just pull all of this in for now. Now. Uh, Let's do this uh, from the beginning, shall we? So I'm going to remove everything except the dry sand pack. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a simple binary segmentation on the grains inside the sand pack. And I'm also going to use a cylinder and let's see if we can do that. So what I shall do is I will go to create a cylinder first. I'm going to create the cylinder here, turn on the visibility. And now I have it. It's here. It's in purple. I'm going to gr grab one vertex, bring it up to the top of my image, grab another vertex, bring it down to the bottom of the image. I'm going to double click here to go full screen. So that looks uh, not quite centered. We'll move it a little bit this way. I'll adjust the radius. Now I'm going to come look at it in this view and we'll bring out the radius a little bit more. That looks pretty good. We might slice through the data set to see how it looks. And we can see that the the core barrel or the whatever's holding the sand pack might be a little uh, askew with respect to the axis. So I'm going to take the top axis and tip it a little bit away, a little bit away. And then I'll go down to the bottom slice and I'll line up the uh, bottom position. Anyway, I think that's pretty close. And so now we have a mask, or actually at this point we just have a cylinder. What I can do now is I can create a new region of interest, and I'm going to call this region of interest my cylinder mask. Now I can take my cylinder and I can add to ROI and add it to my cylinder mask and click OK. Now all the pixels here are labeled. This gives me the ability to take this ROI and use one of the features I like, which is split at O2. That'll take all the pixels covered by this region of interest 
and it will perform an O2 automatic thresholding based on the histogram intensity of just those labeled pixels. So it must compute the histogram on all of that, then apply an automatic thresholding. That gives us two new ROIs, a background and a foreground. So the background should be the pore space. So I'll label this pore space and I'll make it blue. And these are my grains. I'm not really gonna use those right now. So here is my pore space and here is my cylinder mask. Now I can make measurements in Dragonfly based on intensity or based on ROIs and we'll see the sort of measurements that we can make right now. I'm not actually going to measure porosity by slice. I don't have that capability but you're going to see we're 99% of the way there and you'll be able to get the last 1% of the way on your own. What I can do at this point is I can choose any one of these views as an axis for slice analysis. I'm gonna choose the view on the lower left, which is to say I wish to make uh, measurements starting from this slice one, going all the way through slice 1363 along this axis. You could do it on any of these axes, but I think this is the interesting axis. I will right click and choose start slice analysis. Now I have a new dialog over here appearing on a slice analysis tab, but I'm gonna undock that. I'm gonna drag it over here and I'm gonna widen it. What we see here are the option to make measurements. The object I can measure could be a region of interest such as the pore space, or it could be an image such as the dry sand pack. And I have different measurements I can make depending on whether it is an image or a region of interest. So dry sand pack, I can measure the mean intensity, the median intensity, etc. If I choose the pore space, now I have different options. So I have one of them is ROI area. If I compute ROI area, then it's gonna compute the area of that ROI on every slice. Now it's already done it, and you see down here that I clicked that checkbox, and then I hit compute. Now in the table, you see that there are measurements for ROI area. There are measurements actually for 1,363 slices, and the slice with the smallest area has zero square microns, the slice with the largest area, 21, I don't know, million or billion, uh, 21 million cubic microns, and the current slice, which happens to be slice 134, has this area. As soon as you click on any one of these measurements, you will see a plot. So this is how the square area of pore space changes by slice. So I can scroll through the data and I can say, oh, look, it goes up and then down and then up and then down. I can try and relate it to the image and you can also use this index. So you can see that this is correlated. Now this is showing me a slice or this is showing me square area of pore space. Now this is not porosity, but it is directly proportional to porosity. So this porosity would just be this divided by the square area of our cylinder mask. Now we could do that measurement as well. So if I did a right click here and I asked for start slice analysis again, and I dragged this over here, I could then uh, come here and widen it. And I will tell it, I wish to look at the cylinder mask and I wish to know the ROI area and I will compute. Now, I will plot this as well, and it looks like, as we say, the area is constant over this entire field of view. Now, what you'll see here is basically the porosity that you want is this number divided by this number. So you could just export both of these numbers out into spreadsheets, so you could hit the save to save the plot, or you could uh, click export, and then we'll export all of the tabular data computed over all rows to a spreadsheet. That will give you the porosity by slice. So you have the ability to view and inspect your data um, uh, on this orientation. Now, if I'm over here and I'm changing the slice number, it's not gonna do anything. So obviously you want to change the slice number of this oriented slice. So I can do it this way, or I could do it this way. Here, let's look at the more interesting plot while we're doing it, or I can do it this way. Whoops, I missed. Or we can do it this way. If you have multiple measurements, we'll see that in the next example, you'll have multiple, you can have multiple plots. If you have multiple measurements made on the same object. In this case, this is one measurement made on pore space, and this is a separate measurement made on cylinder mask. Um, now, I mentioned that if you tip your plane and you go to a different orientation, so if I tip this plane, oops, let's grab it, tip it, um, I no longer have these measurements. They're gone, they're, I don't have them anymore. If I want them, I have to compute them again. Even if I come back to the XY plane, those measurements are gone. I'm sure we will add a feature so that we can keep track of all of the different orientations you've made, but for now, it is not there. You lose those measurements if you have not exported them or saved them. So uh, that is your warning. All right, I'm going to uh, remove these data. Let's just do that, and I'm going to import a data set that I got from the Digital Rocks portal. So I'll show you with that data set if you wish to get the same data and follow along. So we'll 
point Google to Digital Walks portal. And once inside, we will click the Browse Publish Projects page. Then we will, you could search this page, Control F, you could search this page for Dual. You will find Dual Energy Medical CT. So this is a collaborative project done by Masha Pradanovich at University of Texas and Rodolfo Victor at Petrobras. I've met a few Rodolfos from Petrobras, but I don't think I've met uh, Dr. Victor here. So this is an interesting work. There is a publication showing a new method for evaluating and computing Rho, B, and Z F from dual energy scans using a Monte Carlo statistical approach rather than the more algebraic approach that's been done in the literature over the previous uh, 15 to 20 years. Uh, we're not going to get into that today. There are two data sets, or I should say there are three different data sets from three different segments of core sample and for each one there is the 100 keV scan, the 140 keV scan, then there is their computed uh, row B I say row B for bulk density, uh, here they're using the term row E, but there is uh, a mean row intensity or a mean bulk density for every pixel and the standard deviation and likewise for effective atomic number. I don't know what the, this is. I haven't had a close look at this paper. What we're going to do is use these two data sets. Now I already have those in my workspace or I should say I've already downloaded and unpacked the zip file. And so if you unpack the file that you download from there, it usually comes as an archive.zip. And then if you open up the archive.zip, there will be a folder called origin and then folders marked 435, 436, etc. I've renamed my folders so I can keep track of them here. And what I want is folder 435, which has an images folder and then has this raw file. This is the raw uh, medical CT scan data uh, acquired at 100 keV. KVP. It says KEV. I suppose it's KVP. Now this prompts open the raw reader. Now this is 512 by 512 but it happens to be unsigned to short. Now if you look at this image you'll notice something bizarre going on here. It looks like the contrast has this inverted behavior. It turns out that most scientific images are encoded as unsigned short integer. However, sometimes people will use signed integers and so what's happening is these are very high values well, I, I can't really explain why the numbers get wrapped around uh, uh, in when you misinterpret uh, signed integers as unsigned. All you really need to know is you can click this checkbox and then you'll have proper interpretation of this image. So here's the core sample, here's some reference materials and some sort of uh, uh, chassis or loading sample uh, that has some screws on one end. So 512 by 512 by 758, unsigned short, signed to data, click next. Uh, the data size here, or the pixel size I should say, is specified on the Digital Rocks portal page. So it's 0 .488, 0 .488, 0 0.488, and 1.25 microns per pixel in the Z. So this is the 100 keV image. Now I could choose import another data set and click continue. And here we'll grab the 140 kvp. So I'm going to go up a couple of folders, then choose the 140. Here's the other raw file, and I will choose next. and. I have these parameters are already set from the last time, so that looks good. I'll click next. And it does still need to know the pixel size, which was 0 0.488 and 0 0.4488 and 1.25. Now I will click finish and it should load both of those data sets into Dragonfly. Darn it, my my captions are not showing. Alright, captions are showing again. Okay, I have these two data sets, 140 and 140 kvp. Now, uh, you could try and align the two data sets if they're not aligned. Uh, they're just a little bit off. Uh, probably won't be too disruptive for what we want to do here. Now, I have these two data sets. One is 140 and one is 100 kvp. Now, with slice analysis, I could just right click on a data. Uh, I could just right click on a view, choose slice analysis. And now I could say, well, I'm interested in mean intensity of the 100 kvp sample. So I could choose mean intensity. Maybe we'll do mean and median and hit compute. Now it's going to go through uh, all 758 slices on that image channel and compute the mean intensity by slice and the median intensity by slice. If you are paying attention and you're thinking ahead, you're saying, well, do I really want the mean intensity over the whole slice? I probably only care about the core sample right there in the middle. So if we look at mean intensity, we can see, okay, there's some mean intensity here and it goes up and then down. So it goes up when I have sort of uh, uh, some other things in the field of view and then down. Yes. Uh, as you have noted, this mean is being weighted by all of these air pixels around the outside, so that's not what we want. We clearly want to apply a mask. 
Um, and we could, if we looked at mean and median at the same time, so I'll do a control click, we can see, uh, oh, interesting, the median is changing on a slice by slice basis in an interesting way. We could, might wanna dig into that deeper. But we, can, we do know that we want to apply a mask. So let's create a mask. So we'll do it the same way we did before. Um, I'm just gonna drag slice analysis down here. I'm going to go to the shapes panel, create a new cylinder, turn on the visibility of the cylinder, grab one vertex, move it to the top, grab another vertex, move it to the bottom. Whoops, I grab the edge instead of the vertex. Hmm, let's move this so you can still see the captions. That's gonna take some getting used to. I'm gonna double click to go full screen. I'm gonna reposition the center of this. That looks pretty well centered uh, in that view and looks reasonably centered. Uh, maybe make a little adjustment here, but probably the best view is to come over here. So let's position it in this view and we'll drag it out and I'll scroll through. Okay, I don't have any of the core barrel and I'll also look at the second image to see if, uh, yeah, we can use the same cylindrical mask. Now at this point, I just have a cylinder object. I don't have a cylinder ROI. So we do want to create a cylinder ROI. You know, I'm just gonna close the slice analysis so I can see the rest of my Dragonfly screen. So we, as we saw on the previous example, we will just go to segment, create a new ROI and click OK. And now we will take cylinder and we will add to ROI. And there we are. And so this is our cylinder mask. Now, if we then, what is this window down here? Is this my zoom window? Hopefully that's not in the way. Now, if we repeat our slice analysis, so uh, let's say we come down here, right click and do start slice analysis. We can once again make measurements on the 100 kvp sample. So the sample I wanna study is the 100 kvp sample. Do I wish to use a mask? Yes, let's use the cylinder mask. Now let's once again compute mean and median and hit compute. Now it's gonna go through and compute those measurements every slice, slice by slice, computing the mean intensity and the median intensity, but is only going to evaluate the pixels covered by the mask. So now my mean will not be weighted by all of those air pixels outside the mask. Okay, now we have mean intensity and median intensity. I click if I wanna see both. And so maybe on some slices there's uh, some deviation on other slices it looks pretty close. And so places where it dips are probably places where there's uh, some fractures or maybe some fracture infill. Let's turn this off for a second. So if I uh, uh, increase the contrast, you can see there's something going on on this slice. Whereas when we look at some of these other slices, we don't have as much. So that's interesting. So that is how we would evaluate the mean and median intensity of this. And if we uh, create another uh, slice analysis, we can look at the other at the same time. When I say that, I mean we could create another slice analysis to probe the 140 kvp sample uh, at, at the same time. Let me move this up. So we could choose to probe the 140 kvp sample, use the mask, and again choose the mean and the median, and hit compute. Now, all the measurements that we've made so far have been computed down this nominal Z axis, just looking at XY slices. Now that's arbitrary. I, I can, as I say, tip the orientation of my view and make a measurement. So if my data set is not aligned with that axis, it's really no problem. So I can select this and maybe select this. And now I can scroll through the slices and see how the two correlate now. Uh, if I'm doing two different samples, I might want my windows the same width. Uh, and now I can, uh, whoops, I should have grabbed on the other one since it is in the foreground. So we're looking at the two different data sets, uh, the uh, 140 here and the 100 here. As I mentioned, you can export the data at any time you want. And uh, just to show you that you can do the uh, uh, work on an angle that's not the X, Y axis, I could, for example, take both of these and if they happen to be rotated, like if they happen to exist like this in the workspace, then uh, I could uh, interrogate here. Now I probably should have tipped the cylinder at the same time. What happens if I hit undo? You know, they're both undone. Let's select all three at the same time and rotate. Now, uh, if instead of going down this slice, instead, let's go to track mode. Instead, I want to inter, whoops, I meant to grab this. So I could always tip this plane so that uh, it is normal to this axis. So we could scroll down looking at data this way. So uh, if we do that, 
then we could uh, repeat the analysis just by right click and choosing start slice analysis. So uh, I think that's everything on the agenda. You can make multiple measurements on images or ROIs. You did see there are some limitations. If you tip away, you'll lose your measurements. You also see that we can't make measurements on multiple image channels or multiple ROIs and show them both on the uh, same plot, but you can do it with multiple plots. Uh, I just thought of one more thing I should mention. When you are doing slice analysis, uh, I, we looked just briefly at some at some of the measurements you can make. So under images, you could see min and max uh, per slice. You can see range and mean, standard deviation and variance, etc. You can add your own measurements. So maybe we could cover that in a, a Python lecture, but you can add your own measurements that will appear in the list. There are also measurements I also want to cover when the measure measured object or the object studied is an ROI. There are different measurements. And so one of these is, for example, perimeter of the labeled ROI. So if you are doing bone analysis and you want to know the endocortical perimeter or the endoosteal perimeter, if you wanted to do the endoosteal perimeter, then you could just segment the medullary space and then compute the perimeter. So you'll also see uh, a moment of inertia measurements such as uh, these I and J. And uh, gosh, what's TH? I don't remember what TH is. Uh, we'd have to look. Oh, it says right there, mean thickness. So it'll be the mean. Oh, wow, that's nice. We have a mean thickness per slice. That could come in really useful. Um, so that's going to measure on that ROI on a slice by slice basis. All right, that is, uh, that is it. Let's move on to questions and answers. Let me see if I can pull up the q &A. I saw lots of questions popping up. All right, it looks like Dragonfly software causes lag in the video feed or it's just my crappy internet. That doesn't explain why your mouse movements are not synchronized with your voice. Yeah, I don't know why. I mean, we could consider switching away from the Zoom platform, but uh, otherwise I'm not sure what the answer is going to be. Next question. Uh, so Matt in New Mexico never sees any kind of lag. Yeah, it may be that some of you, maybe your home internet connections have a latency and or maybe the audio is streamed faster than the voice for some reason. Next question. I have registered multiple times, but don't get meeting invitations and I am re-registering each day. Hmm. Let's see don't get multiple limitations. Well, your name should only appear once in the registration roles. Uh, you have you are re-registering each day, but you, you're here, so you must have gotten the invite. Uh, just send me an email, Andrew, um, and we'll we'll work it out. If you have other people that want to attend, they can just register under, under different names. Next question, I have the same problem. I've registered multiple times, but not meeting invitations. So are you looking for more than one meeting invitation? Is that the issue, or you're not getting any meeting invitations? Um, Next question, I have 100 image mosaic that need to be segmented. Can I use one of the images that make up the mosaic to train and segment the entire mosaic? Yes. So if you have done a 2D SEM mosaic, you could use one or two or five or any number of slices or tiles to do the training. And then once you train the model, you could apply it to the entire stack and segment everywhere. You can do the same thing for overlapping 3D volumes. Next question is, please do not remove the, remove the captioning. It's likely requested for a reason. There are people who need this function and it's likely more accurate than the closed captioning function on YouTube. All right, thank you for your feedback, Lars. Next question, when creating a cylinder shape, why don't you start with the cylinder axis along the z-axis? Hmm, good question. I don't know. In 2020.1, you will find that for any cylinder object, there are three buttons, snap my axis, snap my cylinder axis so that it's coaxial with Z, with X, or with Y. So you can just solve it with one button. You don't have to do this dragging that I've done in these demos. Lars, I think it's disruptive if you put a piece of paper on your screen covering it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess you could, if, if it is disruptive for you, you could just uh, cover up the captioning so it's out of your way. Next question is, can you type in size and angle of a cylinder shape? I often want to make it parallel to the z-axis, but it's hard to do with the mouse. So um, in the next release, you are able to input the x, y, z coordinate position of the respective vertices. But as I just mentioned, you won't need to do this because you'll just click the button that says snap to z. Next question, you have zero values for area in the first slice, both in the cylinder mask and in the pore space. If you mask with the shape, why is there, why is this zero? So when you, I guess the plotting function does not return an undefined. So if your mask has zero pixels, then the value it will return for that will be zero. So if there's zero pixels in that slice. It has to put something. It, it can't just not plot a number, which would probably be the desired behavior here. So that's why it's plotting zero when you run off the end of the mask. 
Next question, when choosing to import another data set and selecting to keep the geometry options, the pixel size info is not retained and needs to be re-entered for every data set. Um, yes, and I think that is probably by design. So if you were trying to import multiple data sets and some of them have the pixel size properly encoded and some of them do not, and you happen to do them in, in the wrong order, then it would override the pixel size of, slight, of data, imported data sets two and three and four with the pixel size you input for, for data set one. And that may not be what you want if, if data sets two, three, and four already have the proper pixel size encoded. So I guess you can't have it both ways. So we chose the one that is most loyal to the data as it's encoded on the disk. Next question is, can we add annotations to the plot and save it? Uh, there, I believe, is no capability for adding annotations. However, you can save the plot. If you click this Save button, you have the option of saving as a graphic, such as a PNG, or as an encapsulated postscript for a manuscript quality uh, plot. But uh, also, as I've noted, you could just uh, save the data. So if you click Export, you can save the whole thing to a CSV, and then you can make the plot in another plotting tool that gives you maybe a little more fl flexibility than what we've implemented in Dragonfly. All right, next question. Uh, does Dragonfly allow for calculation of circularity of each object, either in 3D or 2D? Uh, I think the short answer is no. Uh, the long answer is we would have to see what your definition or image J or whatever your reference definition is for circularity. And then we have to see if it matches up with any of the calculations we have provided. We do have aspect ratio. Uh, we may have equivalent spherical diameter. I know we've done that as a, as a lesson example. So. If you want, you can log a request or tell us what circularity is there or what circularity you find useful. Not just showing it in ImageJ, but maybe showing the paper where it was described so we can understand uh, when it's best to apply. Next question, upvoting of questions is still not showing. Ah, darn it. Well, look, I, I thought it said you could see all the questions and you could upvote them. Maybe I missed a checkbox in the Zoom preferences. Next question, could you consider a lesson in dealing with non-uniform brightness for segmentation? Uh, yes, could you send me some data that we could share that other people could use for a lesson on non-uniform brightness for segmentation? So there are tools in the image processing panel that allow you to deal with this. We could also look at how you could do a more complicated workflow involving uh, segmentation with Watershed and, and Sobel, but uh, that will require some demonstration data. Uh, there's no meeting invitation for the day. Hmm, maybe... Hmm, how did you guys join the meeting if there's no invitation for today? Uh, is there a way to specify precise dimensions and orientations for shapes, planes, etc.? I'm having trouble aligning it. So there you go. Uh, everything you want with adjusting the parameters for your shapes uh, has been remedied with the update in Dragonfly. You know, you guys uh, uh, are very interested in that and you've been very patient. Uh, I'll just uh, very quickly, I know you can't see the captioning. I'm going to let Dragonfly 2020.1 launch so you can see it. Uh, we do have the ability on some, oops, where are my captions? Captions are on. Captions are on. We do have the ability to grant beta testing. So we're looking at a approximately 10 day horizon. Uh, if things hold steady, for when we will release 2020.1, but you know nothing's nothing's done until we've it's met all of our uh, critical bug testing. However, if you would like to use it before the official release, uh, we are offering some limited beta testing so we can get you that in your hands. Now let's see, did the uh, okay? We're still waiting on the 2020 to launch on my machine. Then I'll show you this uh, this uh, parameter control for shapes. Is it possible to omit the occurred crack from the ROI in order not to consider its calculation and porosity? Uh, yes, so you could subtract it from both. So you could segment the crack and then subtract it from both your pore space segmentation and you could s subtract it from your cylinder uh, your cylinder mask. Then it would not be enter into your, your, your quotient. Next question is, we used to get a daily reminder uh, for the old set. Since the set of new tutorials began, we received an email with a link to join the meeting but stopped receiving daily reminders. Okay, I understand. Okay, so what I will do is, uh, after I enslave my children to correct your names on the registration rolls, I will change the Zoom settings to for the email reminders so they go out one hour in advance of every webinar, and we'll see if that gives everyone the proper link to join 
for the webinar. I understand that you could use the same, they are using the same meeting ID, so if you have the link from yesterday, you could use it, but it's convenient to have uh, an email in your box with the link for the ne next webinar. Uh, next question, you once gave me a plugin for Sphericity. I'm not sure if it is available in the Infinite Toolbox, but it can answer the previous question. Uh, okay, I don't know if Sphericity is there or not. Maybe our Sphericity measure that we demonstrated at least once would meet the circularity requirement. So we'll have to look and see if we can get that in the Infinite Toolbox or just part of the production release. I am unable to find the checkbox for signed data. Can you repeat how you got this? So this is only going to occur if you are telling Dragonfly that the data is not a uh, char or byte. It's only going to be valid if you're telling it that it is type short and then you will find that checkbox showing up on the screen. So let's see if my Dragonfly is open. Oh, it's prompting me, do I want to restore uh, an autosave session? I'm clicking no. All right, we have captioning on the bottom of the screen and uh, we're going to just, let's see, let's have uh, a data set. Hmm, noise, 100 by 100 by 100 by 1, mean value 128 with a, a Gaussian range of 128 applied to 100%. You can ignore all this. Okay, now I have a data set. Now, if I wanted to create a cylinder, uh, here I can create a cylinder object. And now you will notice right away when the cylinder is selected, you see extra properties down below. So what do we have in the size? In the size, so uh, it looks like I can input the, I can edit the the center coordinate. Now a cylinder has uh, three control points, if you will. It has three vertices that are relevant. It has the center vertex, which really can be used to translate, and then you have the two end vertices. Of course, these are constrained. They must be collinear. But basically, you can uh, edit the coordinate position of either of the end coordinates, and you can also, the last control point is the radius. You can edit the radius directly. However, um, you see that this happens to be co-aligned with Z, which is what the user was asking a few minutes ago. But if you didn't, you could snap it to Y or to X. So, or you could align it with a particular data set. I'm not sure. Uh, okay, yeah, I guess maybe one snaps to the nominal X axis and the other snaps to a data set's X or Y axis. All right, um, regarding invitation, I guess what people mean is that the previous batch we got had daily emails to sign in and that's not happening. So we'll see if we can resolve that. I do not understand how these measurements can be calibrated using a scale. Can you show how to do that? Well, yes, we could. Um, if you, most scientists I know of do not have intensity calibration for their images. For example, the values we are looking at today on the CT scan, they were values between, I don't know, negative 32,000 and positive 32,000. If you had them scaled to something, it would be meaningful. You could, for example, if I right click on, uh, oh, I, I've got a issue in my Dragonfly beta. I'm waiting for the menu to pop up. Let's try once again. If I go to image properties on an image channel, I can come over here and say that, you know, if you apply a certain, uh, let's say, uh, slope and offset and uh, we call this uh, mic units and hit apply. Uh, now my image is rescaled in mic units. So you see it goes from 0 to 716 mic units. So if you have a slope and an offset you can encode an arbitrary value here and then when you do those measurements with slice analysis or probe or anything else or even in your window leveling you're now working on the calibrated units. If you guys have a calibration procedure and, and sample data, we could uh, make a lesson out of that, but I don't have any data that have, have been calibrated or have a calibration scale. All right, uh, a few more questions on the invitation. All right, and that's it. Those are all the questions. So thank you for your patience. Thank you for enjoying this lesson. No lessons for the next two days, uh, but uh, please tune in uh, to the CCEM workshop lessons on process image processing for electron microscopy or return with us on Monday with Dragonfly Daily episode number 23. All right, everyone stay healthy. See you then.